Welcome to A Chat With Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm here to guide us on this journey of heartfelt and uncensored conversations with friends I've met while touring my music in Europe and across North America, and people who have life experience that I genuinely believe we can all learn from. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. If we just talk about it, we could shut up. Hey, Heartbeat listeners. I hope you're doing awesome. Dale and I recently returned from a trip to Columbus, Ohio. We were visiting my brother, Alex. He lives right downtown near the high street. And uh, yeah, we had a great time. We caught a Smashing Pumpkins concert. That was fantastic. I continue to be feeling really great lately. And I'm telling you, I think it's because I cleared a lot of shit off my plate And I'm still focusing on uh, one thing at a time right now. I've been getting back to morning meditation, writing a bit. And uh, Dale and I are getting back into rehearsing music more regularly. So feeling pretty good. And yeah, I'm not over committing anymore. Fuck that. The weather's been great here in Port Howe, Nova Scotia. And we've been biking and uh, cleaning up our yard. Life feels simple, sweet, slow. Thanks for being here. I want to give you a solid trigger warning because at times during this episode, we discuss domestic violence. If that's a trigger for you, then feel free to skip this episode or come back and listen in the future when you feel more comfortable. And if you listen and discover that the content is a trigger for your mental health, because maybe you didn't expect it would be, please talk to a mental health professional and or uh, a trusted friend or your primary care doctor. You can often find free emergency phone lines for mental health wherever you're listening from. Sometimes just a simple uh, search on the internet will get you a phone number you can call and ask for help. If you get stuck, you can call my Heartbeat Hotline. Leave me a message saying you heard the episode and you'd like to get some help, and I'll do my best to find someone you can call and talk to. My Heartbeat Hotline number is in Canada, but you can call from anywhere in the world. The number is... 1-902-669-4769. This is a very special, very precious to me episode with my friend Louise Renault. I was introduced to Louise as host of CBC Radio 1's Daybreak and co-host of Information Morning for Mainland Nova Scotia. We bonded at a music festival campground years back where we discovered we both had atypical family histories, siblings from other mothers, And our dads had a lot of secrets that were really fucking annoying to us and the rest of our family. Louise opens up about her life and her family. Now, I don't love hearing when someone else experiences struggle and pain and loss, but I will admit sharing bits of our story um, made me feel like less of a solo weirdo for what I've experienced myself. I'm still a weirdo. I, I just don't feel as solo, (laughs) you know, one of the sparks for this podcast was uh, a curiosity and desire to, uh, share examples of how we get through the good, the bad, and the ugly in life. Shit happens. And yet there are still beautiful moments and connections to create and life to live to the best of our abilities. We struggle, we persevere, we overcome, We fall again, we get back up again, we keep trying as long as we can. So I really hoped a chat with Heart would end up being a safe space to share difficult conversations, important conversations. And my friends and Heartbeat listeners, you have made that happen. And Louise has been a big part of this. She was one of the first people to call my Heartbeat hotline. And the result was this beautiful conversation, getting to know more about her story. So here we are, two weirdos, having a chat with heart. Uh, I've got to put that on a t-shirt. What 
Welcome to A Chat With Heart podcast. Louise Renault, I'm so happy you're here. I am probably even more delighted to be here. It's so great. It's great to uh, see you. I know that the listeners won't be able to see us, but it's great to see you. And uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Me too, because I've been listening to your voice for so many years <laughs> um, as the host of CBC Radio Once Daybreak and co-host for Information Morning for mainland Nova Scotia. And now it's time to hear more about your life in in depth. One of the things I was curious about was uh, your decision to stop waking up at 3.50 a.m. I just, I couldn't get up at 3.50 anymore. It's a great gig in a whole lot of ways. Like it's a privilege. And I remember when I started, there was some kind of little gathering party down in the cafeteria in the old CBC building. And and there was this older woman, an, an elder, I will call her, whose name escapes me, but she worked in broadcasting forever. And she just came up to me with her little cane, she was quite small, and, and gripped my arm and said, you morning show people deserve a medal for getting up every day. And I remember thinking shit, this is going to be really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, what am I in for? Yeah. And so just that's give me the, the only, medal. Exactly, just give me the medal later, whatever. But so it there, so one, yes, it's hard. I don't know what's harder. Connelly and I used to talk about it. Go, the going to bed early or the getting up early. Um, I am yeah. a morning person, but that is not, that's not morning. It's like the middle of, it's the time you normally wake up and hope to go back to sleep or whatever. Right. Yeah. And so, so getting up in the dark every single day of the year, however, you go home in daylight mm. every single day of the year. And that's a great advantage. And because of where I live, I walk in the woods in the afternoon, all that stuff, but you don't sleep as well. And not only because you're getting up early, but because you're terrified of sleeping in, mm -hmm. like you yeah. can't sleep in because you're waking everybody else up. Right. Yeah. And then also the news cycle, you're so plugged into it. And that's, especially the last few years, uh, tough. Hard on your on nerves. The, on the brain. Yeah. Tough on your nerves. And then you, there's an accumulation factor, I would say. So you're doing this year on you and gee whiz, you're getting older every year as well. Uh -huh. And perhaps you're going through menopause. <laughs> you know, perhaps one after perhaps another. Possible to throw another aspect that messes with your sleep. And, and what started to happen for me is that, man, I hated Sunday afternoons. I mean, a lot of people do that don't want to go back to their nine to five job. But like by three o'clock, I was like, mm. not a happy pup. Once I was there, I, you know, I love being on the air and I had a great time. But there's a rigidity that you have to keep. Now, you like routine probably more than I do. Like you have to eat, you know, early, like, so start cooking at four, eat by five, uh, you know, make sure you've got your lunch made, your clothes laid out. Cause you don't want to be doing that. Not everybody operates that way, but most people who do morning shows, you know, you've got your clothes laid out. Maybe tomorrow I'll get up and I don't know. I don't yeah. like what I laid out kind of thing. So, oh my God. It's, so th there's that whole prep preparatory part and yeah. really it is the accumulation. And I remember too, I think my first year that I started and, I think once I had the contract, um, because I, I filled in for a while, but I remember thinking, I have to treat this like it's a long running Broadway show or something like where you have to stay in shape. Yeah, It's like you touring probably like you have to be disciplined about taking care of yourself. I was beginning to really hate the routine of getting to it, not the work. That's why it was so hard. I mean, yeah, and, you, you yeah. have other desires and passions that you probably are like, wanting to give your attention to other gifts yeah. tell us about some of those yeah. things that you're in that you're enjoying in, oh yeah now. now well i was in a band when i started uh, like a cover band with friends when i started on information morning but then i had to quit because i just couldn't rehearse on a tuesday night and i didn't want to do a show on a weekend because i was doing a show every day kind of thing. so yeah. um but in the last couple of years i have started to uh, play with a bunch of guys um there were seven of us in the band, a band called Saltwater Roses, who've been around for a long time, Beatles cover band. These guys are great players. They've all had other jobs, but they have always played. In fact, the Roses put out a CD or two, I think. So yeah, that's a great passion. My guitar chops are, are starting to improve, but my singing chops have grown enormously. It's nice that you get to do some other things now. Oh, it is. And, and also, honestly, that I have the energy. Like, I don't think I knew how tired... I was 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew he was tired. Everybody that has morning shows, they're always, they're tired. They're just, it's a given. <laughs> but like, I remember I would drive to go get a massage and I'd have to pull over in his neighborhood first to sleep in the car for 10 minutes because I couldn't drive any further. Imagine. Yeah. The only time we've done that is after a flight, a uh, red eye flight to Europe. Right. And where we thought we could drive three hours to get the gear. And then that happened once. And I was like, we're never doing this again. <laughs> we're booking a hotel at the airport, going yeah. to sleep for the day. And then and resetting. On. It's just yeah. too. It's so dangerous. But it's yeah, it's totally dangerous. You were one of my first uh, listeners to call the Heartbeat Hotline for this podcast, and uh, one of my intentions with that phone line was to invite listeners to help shape the conversations. And look, Ooh. it's working. Here we are. You mentioned on the hotline um, you'd like to hear more stories about dads and complicated yeah. backgrounds. <laughs> so, well, first of all, trigger warning to listeners, because yeah. there may be, the, yes. it, there may be some heavy shit coming out there of this. some heavy shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah we, we've bond, bonded, really, we yeah. connected on our complicated backgrounds in the past. And I've certainly had lots of time to think about how the things that happened to me growing up, the, the relationships I had have affected my life, have made me who I am today, have made me challenge who I am or, you know, and mm. well, first I was going to ask you to tell me more about your father. I can tell you about my father. Let's talk about dads and yeah. your, let's start with your dad. Benoit. Ben. ben Benoit. Benoit. Yeah. Benoit Renault. Joseph Benoit Renault. You know, French Catholics always have the Joseph, the boys have mm-hmm. Joseph in front so of them. So did my dad too, Joseph yeah, Robert and, Martin. And Marie, so I'm Marie-Louise Evangeline Renault. Like, Whoa. Yeah, I know. Oh, it's very long. It. Yeah, Ben Ben Renault, one of 13 kids. Wow. From Campbellton. And he was a doctor. He was a, he was a GP. He and my mom met. Uh, they went to school, high school together. I think mm-hmm. she was a year or two ahead of him. They married in 1950 and i'm the youngest of six kids you're the baby i'm the boo-boo yeah i'm the little baby at the end. yeah so i was born into uh like the party was already happening you know what i mean like the, all the kids yeah. and the busy yeah, busy and fun and noisy and loud and um did they look but, after you or were oh, yeah. they like yeah <laughs> it's just another kid no whatever. no i was like fight it was like my mother had i was talking about my mother now, my, dad. my mom okay. had five kids in six years I'll just let that settle. In an era before disposable diapers, Christina. Ouch. She had, because she had twins too. So there was Michel, Nicole, Jacques, and then the twins, Pierre and Paul. And then me five years later. My parents divorced when I was really young. When I was, we left when I was six. And this is like 1968. People just didn't, Catholics did not. Nobody oh, was doing divorce. That's a faux pas, yeah. Yeah, it was a big deal. And um, but my me- I have some I have some good memories of him. Yeah. Uh, he was a great cook. He spoiled me. Every day he would come home for lunch from his practice, and he would take me down to Louis Taxi in Shediac on the main drag, which it was like a five and dime confectionery. There were hula hoops hanging on the ceiling and there was like pogo sticks and there was penny candy. And it was like, it was paradise. It was basically wow. paradise, right? Yeah. And he would buy me a treat every day. So I felt very kind of special and spoiled by him as the baby. Those first five years were mostly quite good. I mean, I have memories of like sitting in our neighbor, Mrs. Casey's garden in the middle of a row, eating peas, you know, early in the morning. Cause I just loved her garden and, um, and chasing the cows that were behind us in the field behind the house. And very, it sounds very idyllic. Right. But I also have memories of very loud fights, uh, between my parents of a mirror getting smashed in the middle of the night mm. of, you know, a dented, uh, bathroom door, uh, mm. because of someone's head was put, you know, and I just, so there was, they, the, the marriage was not in good shape. Yeah. And she left him when I was about two. I don't remember that, of course, uh, but then came back. And, It'll be hard. hard oh yeah. Hard. There's a lot of stories about, oh yeah. Very brave and a hard, and a lot of stories about that. I was about to turn six. My birthday's in July and I was about to turn six. I remember my sixth birthday morning too. Like I remember getting up and going to the dresser and going. Me too. I have a six, seriously, that was for me, I said it in another podcast episode, I think, but turning six was to me like I was an adult. You're on the second hand. Like you've got yeah. 
five fingers and plus one, right? Yeah. I was, I'm a so woman now. I'm a yeah, woman. I'm a woman now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, I was singing Downtown by Petula Clark in my go-go boots walking down to the main drag at the age of five. So yeah. Same. Anyway. <laughs> Appropriate. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was about to start school and my mother um, did not want me to go to school a school where the two my two half brothers <laughs> were there because my dad was an adulterer my dad had a relationship with other like he did you remember like the unbearable lightness of being it's okay i'm a doctor take your clothes off that was my father like i think he you know he, he you know in the middle of the night the phone would ring and he'd say i've got to go deliver a baby because he was the doctor in town and she'd go okay and going to cap and, but mm -hmm. he was going to see his girlfriend and, and she, I have a couple of half brothers. I'm not interested in meeting them. It doesn't, it, I got lots of siblings. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like, it, it was such a small town. And so, and mom just didn't want that me to deal with that. And just also, I'm sure she just had it. Sure. And so we left and went to uh, Campbellton, stayed with my grandparents, her parents. And I did my first year there and thus began my life of moving. No wonder I became a freelancer. It was just kind of normal to just, you know. Go with the flow. Go with the <laughs> flow and move yeah. somewhere else. Luckily, I, I like talking to people. I can relate to not moving that many times, but we did move after my dad left us, mm. which it wasn't pitched like he left us. It was oh, all very- Oh, me too. Dad's on a business trip. And, but I knew there was, there was always an air of we were, we had to keep the secret. So I knew there was something wrong but he was on a business trip. That's what we were to tell people and that we would be together again someday. That was always the message. Mm. And then once they got older and we were spending summers with my dad and sometimes holidays, um, my dad started to open up to me a bit more mm. about things. And I realized, well, one, how angry and messed up and uh, he was and mm. uh, he, you know, and and how I could see how that would not be great for my parents to get back together and that they weren't right. going to get back together. And I didn't blame my mom for not wanting to be with this person. And it was good that it was over, but we hear it all the time. People make the best decisions they can. Oh, like yeah. our, our parents thought they were doing the best they could, but I would have liked to know the truth. Sometimes adults, like things are complicated in relationships and we don't know we don't know how things are going to go, but the most important things, we have food, shelter, we love yeah, you, exactly. you know, like yeah. we're going to be honest, you know, we're yeah. not going to hide. Those things go a long ways as opposed to the unknowns and the constant. Yeah, because you make a story when you don't know what the story is, right? Because you. Yeah. So dad, dad left. No, we left. Mom left. You left. Mom left. left. Dad stayed. I would then... visit him sometimes in summer. Just um, you or your other with Sometimes the boys would come, the twins. And I would come for a week, uh, two weeks or a week. But, you know, he never, like, he never initiated any visits. I always got in touch with him. Like Just you because, were asking dad, hey. Can yeah, I like, visit? so can I come visit? Yeah. He never, I never got a birthday card or Christmas card. That's too bad. That's sad. Yeah. And so as a little, you know, when you're that little and then you're a little, your parents are kind of like, they're gods. Like they're, you know, the doctor and he treated me and you know like he was my, spoiled you rotten he spoiled me rotten yeah and I knew you know that he was physical as mom like I knew that but he was still my dad my the six-year-old's view of the dad right yeah I, I mean I think if I hadn't had brothers I really would have been more messed up than I already was because at least I had some guys around me you know guy yeah. energy yeah and my mom was so like there solid I never question her love for me or her she would well she would never have abandoned she would never have left us with him too like she was just like uh -uh, this ain't happening yeah and so that that stability was there so I would visit yeah in summer but I think I always felt abandoned felt like I didn't matter enough um, sure and disposable yeah yeah you're, like you're I, not I'm just well, saying but, but I can, yeah well I remember like, I had written them and we showed up, my sister dropped me, was going to drop me off. His wife, because he had a partner for a very long time, and they had a, like, very um, cocktail lifestyle. You know, they, like, they partied and they had boat and they had, you know, he had a T-bird and they were, you know, having a great time with no kids. Mm -hmm. And um, and I remember her coming around the corner as we pulled up 
oh, we weren't expecting you. And I'm like, I, I wrote. And she's like, you've never heard of registered mail? And I'm like, I have to send a fucking letter registered mail to my father? To, like, yeah. My daughter. Anyway, it was really screwy. Oh. And there, we had a, there was a terrible fight. There was a terrible scene. And I was just so confused. Yes. And I remember going to see his brother, Joe, Joe Renault. They were the only Renaults who stayed um, connected with us because all yeah. the other family members on my dad's side, like, you don't, you don't leave. You know, you don't. In that era, you just didn't. So, but Joe and yeah. Blanche always... Um, we always stayed connected. And so I remember talking to Joe and saying, why would he not want to see me? You know? Yeah. And he said, you know, I, I never understood because Joe was a very sensitive human being. He said, but it's like when you guys left, it's like he closed the door. Like I failed at that or whatever. And I'm just, no, I can't. And, you know, a certain generation not really in touch with their feelings. Sure. Yeah. I, and that shaped, like you said, my approach to relationships, especially with men. Oh, you're unavailable. You're charming, fun at parties, but actually unavailable, you know, emotionally or whatever. You perfect. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I did a lot of work over the years, painful work to, to just kind of realize that I kept trying to recreate a relationship that just never we were not that close you know we were I think he had mental health issues as well and there were certainly some in, in his family and a ton of work a long series of relationships and then trying to figure it out and lots of therapy and uh episodes of depression that I think contributed to all that and the moving and all that stuff in the end he's he's gone he's, he's been dead about almost 20 years now like I didn't get mad at him until I was 30. I was just sad and felt abandoned. And then I didn't get mad until my sister died. Then I started to get mad, but he was sick and not going to get out of it. And I went to therapy, I went to a therapist and I said, look, my father's dying. And I, I know I'm never going to resolve. Like I'm never going to get what I needed. And mm -hmm. I never, and I just want to be in as much peace as I possibly can be because he's going to go. And I know this is important to deal with. So I did, you know, we did, we had some great conversations. I can't remember how she helped me now, but she did just to kind of realize like, this is what it is. This is, yeah, you know, you I, I always think, get closure. You don't exactly. And also like, I think he missed out on a lot, you know, and That's I think right, he missed yeah. by not being close to us. But when I went to see him in the hospital, Christina, and he was, they had amputated one of his leg, part of one of his legs, he had circulatory issues and he was very thin and he was very sick, you know, and he was an old man. And I just looked at him and all of a sudden it was like, number one, he was an old man who was dying mm -hmm. and all my anger and, you know, what's wrong with you? I couldn't you, all that just flew, literally flew out of my chest and out the window. Yeah. And I just saw this man who was suffering and who I was not really, we weren't that close actually. Yeah. You know, and, but that he was dying and he had, he was my father and I was going to be here to connect with him a little bit. And when I sat down next to his bed and he opened, he like looked at me with his like roomy blue eyes and he went, Oh, I'm surprised to see you here. <laughs> okay. And I said, I bet you are. Yeah, wow, kind of doing what? this, kind of doing this for me, Dad. Yeah, no, but but I also thought, wow, that's so he does know he that gets you know it. He, he fucked up, like yes, and that he's lucky that any of us or because some of us didn't go see him. We, you know, we weren't gonna solve. Like I wasn't gonna get to say why the hell. Yeah, you have loved me the way I needed to be loved. God damn it! <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, we just spent time together, and um, there's always gonna be a hurt there. Sure. That little six-year-old, you know, but it's way diminished, way diminished. And I think I had done enough work. But mm. he wasn't able to be there for mm. you. It's just so interesting to me that you, you were still able to be there for him. And, um, you know, I can relate to that being by my dad's bedside when he was dying and being cognizant that like some of his other kids had uh, from previous marriage, uh, my, my half siblings, who uh, some I'm, I'm in touch with today and, and we've developed a relationship, you know, all these years after his death, there was no one else around at that time. Like it right. was my brother, Alex, his last two biological kids, none of the women, the right. leading ladies oh, in yeah. his life, you know, that were a big part of his stories to me and every night, nobody was there. He was alone. And wow. I knew, I was like, this isn't a good sign. Like what's this guy yeah. really, you know, and, and then the burden of, 
having to be that person when you're so confused about your emotions toward this person. Like, do I love this person? They kind of did some horrible things to me that are, are going to last me the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that at the time, but, um, <laughs> you know, that are going to leave the work you had to do and the work that I've done and I continue to do, um, which is in some ways a gift, I'm, I'm sure, but just also super annoying. It would have been nice not to have had to go Yeah, sort of annoying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to do that thing where you're like, oh, come on, put a positive spin so on bad. it. Put like, a, yeah, no. Would we be no, having we this conversation? Talk. No. No, we wouldn't podcast. have. Well, I wouldn't have moved to Montreal. There you go. Yeah, you wouldn't have moved to Montreal. Wouldn't, yeah. have, moved to Mon- wouldn't have grown up in Montreal in the 70s. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's So let's talk some more about, like, I, I put a cutoff on, let's say, up to age 20. Let's talk more about some of those pivotal moments. I know you mentioned yeah. Montreal. Your dad Montreal. leaving Montreal. We us leaving. <gasps> us leaving. Yeah. Do yeah. you know why I say that though? Because he left. He oh left God, you're right. And dad always said that my mom left him, which was complete bullshit. He was right. He had He's cousin gone. Lucy, his his mistress, throughout our entire youth. Oh. Trips to monthly trips to Ottawa. Delivering um, a baby business. in the middle yeah. of the night. Yeah. Right. Business yeah. trips. Um. He left that commitment, you know, and he lied. Yeah. And so and so at some point I switched the the, the narrative to be yeah. more reflect more of the what I felt was the truth. Yeah. Um and he left. And then actually he did. Yeah. <laughs> he did leave yeah. all trying to spin it the other way. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I uh your mom trying to save y'all's asses. <laughs> Frig. Thanks, moms. Like, at a time when it just wasn't it wasn't done. It wasn't done. It was in Catholic. It, it's 1968. Sh- like it's just not but, so much shame around it. Oh yeah, unfortunately. Just, but she was just like she's a very strong woman. She had also met someone, and uh, that, that helps. Helped. Yeah, it helps you move on. I think. Yeah, our dads didn't do a good. No. job of being grown-ups it's- no and so what happened to them right that's the other thing right christina it's like of course there's there's a whole you know they had 13 kids his father was probably uh he had electroshock therapy he was probably bipolar my grandmother isabel renault was a saint she had good mental health she, i think she was yeah, just like happy, strong woman strong happy believed in god and just took care of all 13 kids and interesting um, that our yeah. fathers picked strong Yes. Women, isn't it? Because yes. my mother and my father's first wife, who he had five kids with, and then married her and then married my mom. And I've found similarities between his first wife and then his second wife. Interesting. Eh? Um, who he ended up raising families with, but yet was, you know, totally fucked up, had super yeah. trust, paranoia issues. Um was also quick to blame the women for right, of anything, course. You know, not to take ownership of you know the mistakes. I don't think. I think a lot. I think too. You know, just going back in time, men are just not. That's just that emotional landscape was just not well tilled <laughs> to continue no. that. You know what I mean? And so I think, yeah. it, and as women became more, well, although I think there's a lot of strong women historically in my family too, but. Yeah. I, anyway, I think it's comp, and you have to think about what did they learn. How how was he brought up? You know what? Too like one of my aunts, and not a blood aunt, told me that my mom and dad, like when they were in high school, and then after, she went away to Toronto uh, to work as a nurse for a few years, and uh, and then came back. They kind of were apart then, and got back together. So they'd known each other since high school. Your mom but, was a nurse as well. Yes, yeah, my mom was a nurse. So was my mom. Oh my God. And then you, my we're sisters, like sisters from another litter or something. I think so. And then my, <laughs> my father wouldn't allow her, did not want her to work. Oh, oh like, no. She, my mom worked. Oh God. Ooh. And then yeah. that, that's There's the whole a generational other, thing. That's was, a whole other thing, right? Oh God. Well, yeah. Anyway. Because he took my mom's, when she wanted to go back to work when we were getting older and he said, no, he had a huge fit about it. And uh, then that's hard for <laughs> listeners who are young to imagine like that even happening like in a in a kind of western you know society that that would that would that a husband would actually say no you, I'm sorry you can't go back to work and that it would stick absolutely like I know what effect he had on her self-esteem her self-confidence because I was I still think of my mom as a very strong woman yeah but I could see that being corroded 
over time. Yeah. Not always. Like I could, I remember her standing up for certain things, but still being afraid of this right. guy and having, allowing that, understandably, like the power over, you know. Wow. It's interesting, yeah, to be attracted to strong women. But then yeah. when you get into the nitty gritty, that means you can't always have your way, at, you know, unless you impose it, right? Yeah, Should exactly. Be. Anyway, Montreal, Montreal. So that was a pivotal one of the things in Montreal that was great. You know, it was a time when uh, there was a lot of funding for the arts. Uh, Trudeau Senior was prime minister and there was and Quebec. It was doing it was this and it was a family. Oh, my God, the music. And but there were these little chalets where you go like in the winter, there was a skating rink. And then in summer, it was a uh, tennis court or whatever. And it was a park and stuff. And you'd hung, hang out and drink beers and smoke cigarettes and whatever. And park. So and European. Like party. Cool. Well, kind of anyway, like the great. beer garden, but there's also yeah. like a skating rink or skating a Skating rink. No, you would just drink beer in the summer, not, it wasn't legal. This sounds it was Canadian. more Canadian, yeah. That yeah, was just one mind. summer for me. And then it interfered with some of my other pursuits. So I stopped. But um, th- so there were dances every Saturday night. Um, at four of the different chalets, 75 cents, you can get in lots of great tunes, big sound system, lights. I ran the kitchen uh, and it was pop shop and chips. There was no, I'm sure there were people sneaking in a bit of booze, but I, not really that much. Anyway, so having fun. The guys that ran the lights also um, uh, were part of the theater troupe that was funded locally. Mm. And so I started participating backstage in six a run of six plays that believe it or not staged lord of the rings whoa <laughs> with no money like just low budget yeah totally low budget and oh, but so like what an introduction to theater and um and i hadn't even read the books yet and so i had i had a visual in my head who were you I read like- them oh who was oh i was backstage i was helping move and then but there was also a dance troupe and so i helped backstage they did a whole thing of alice cooper's welcome to my nightmare album Wow. Yeah. With them. And so I was doing the makeup. Everybody's doing the Alice Cooper makeup backstage and then moving props and stuff. And then I went up to the choreographer and I'm like, I like to be in the dance troupe. And this is so un- informal. It's not, you know, well, I was just like, I like dancing. <laughs> Didn't know. And she was like, well, we're, you know, we're like 27. And she said, well, okay. And so I joined this troupe and we we rehearsed three times a week like Sunday afternoons and then two evenings and we put on shows every three months uh we did magical mystery tour album by the Beatles with May it was very creative and fun and terrifying you know to be on stage yeah. uh, I got a solo in the second show I was nice. black magic woman you know yeah. <laughs> how old and were you it, at this point I would have been 14 Okay, that's and a- I was just about to. I was just, you know, when you're 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 getting kind of smart and you're comfortable because you haven't moved now for a few years, and you're having fun, and then you start to shoplift. Okay, yeah. What is it with shoplifting and being an well, adolescent? I think I asked that question. I don't know if it was I online think- um, with one of my guests. Uh, I did hear you ask that question. Actually. Was it a fluster question? Like, I think what, so. What have you? What was something that you stole? You stole. Yeah. And it was. It was like lip, you know, lip balm or um, a choker. And I had I had friends who like would steal record albums, and I'm like, wow, how do you like who were like skinny and had leather mm-hmm. jacks? I'm like, how the hell do you hide a like yeah. a, an album? In your, I was always impressed, but I never had the nerve to do that. It was really about the dare and about the yeah, and, the fix. yeah, and boredom. When I joined the dance troupe, it was like ah, uh, that this was way it like saved me from going. I don't know that I would have gone down the path really far, but well, you could have. You could have been a car theft. I could have been uh, a car, who. You know what? I could have been. You could have been a car thief. A I car mean. thief. I could have been a bank robber. Um, who knows? Sports but were that just, for me, like not. You know, because when you played on the sports teams, I mean, I don't know if you all had rules in your dance troupe or in the... uh, Yeah, there was some... I mean, there were cigarette breaks, but... Oh. was Montreal. (laughs) Yeah, that's... (laughs) You couldn't be late. You had to show up. You had to do the warm-up. That took all that creative imagination energy, and, I, you know, it got poured into this wonderful... We were about 20 
25, 26 of us, but three different guys, three guys, I think. And then this wonderful choreographer a woman named Susan Savage. What a great name. Mm. And she was wonderful and really, um, and I don't think it cost anything. Like, I think it was all subsidized. It was just a great, just took us off the streets basically. Right. That was a very pivotal in that it set my energies towards something creative and constructive instead of stupid bored hanging out not doing anything yeah self-destructive stuff yeah it's time for a fluster break i want to thank those of you listening who have purchased the game fluster online at www.flustergame.com and used my promo code to save 15%. The promo code is Christina15. Yeah, I really hope you're enjoying the game with your friends at home. And um, I hope that you are enjoying these Fluster conversation breaks with my guests. It's called Fluster for a reason, obviously. (laughs) It does fluster you. And the thing about Fluster, which I learned from uh, talking with the creators, Walker and Devin, in episode six, um, was that... You know, sometimes in, in natural conversations, you do veer off topic, and uh, that that's okay. So it's about it's not it's not the uh, it, the destination; it's the journey. Correct, as evidenced by our conversation. <laughs> and that's okay. That's how our, that's this is real. This is a real right. chat with heart. Um. Okay, Louise, what's something you wish you had said, but didn't, because you were worried about the consequences that is a tough one actually yeah because it's like you're gonna say it here now that is tough okay i'll start then okay see what and it you, triggers you, you, don't, you don't have to pay attention to me <laughs> just okay <keep> thinking. um <laughs> la, la, la. i wish that i had uh, I, I remember when my brother stefan called me i was in toronto we were we were on a tour and we were discussing maybe getting together to hang out while we were in Toronto. He lived in Toronto. And I had a sense that he was going through a rough patch. And our rhythm in the past, when I sensed that he was going through a rough patch, was you know, he would go through his rough patch. But any, I didn't, I think I was afraid to say anything specifically um, because he was an addict. And I was afraid, number one, that by me saying something, it would cause him to feel shame. Mm. Um, that it might spark dishonesty and that I wouldn't know how to deal with that conversation. I I just didn't know how to be straightforward in a compassionate kind way, uh, certainly at that time. Mm. And, uh, you know, this, he had, he had survived. So up until this point, right. And I was like, well, I guess it's working for us. And he always seems to come around and like, you know, he had such has had such a great couple of years here, and I, I really, yeah, didn't have such a great understanding of mm. what uh, he was experiencing, and and I was busy, and I chose to kind of. I remember being in Toronto, being in this hotel room with Dale, and just not feeling like hanging out with him and making the effort, and mm. he kind of agreed to, like he was like, yeah, you know, I'm tired, like, and but there was a sense that there was something really wrong going on with him and and I wish I would have said the thing I wish I would have said but I didn't because I was afraid of the consequences um that maybe it would also um split us apart like that he right that he would retreat yeah which I think is very relatable for a lot of people that I've I've heard you know like I don't want to say anything because I want them to stay in my life like I want them to feel like they can call me for whatever and not get a lecture um, and then a uh, month and a half later, he had died from an overdose, a mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. heroin overdose, opioid overdose. Um, not exactly sure what all was in the co- cocktail, but it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. And, um, and there were other signs like in that period of time that again, I, I wish I would have just mm. been more present for him. Yeah. Mm. That was heavy. I was like, That's did heavy. I say, I one. said, hey, let's lighten things up here and play Fluster. Right, play Fluster. And, uh, and then I just got like super serious. <laughs> uh, so the- That's very tough. That's very tough. And that's, and you don't know 
if it would have made any difference, of course. But, That's right. Yeah. But it's so, but I know it, it's this gaping. It's this like, um, it's like when someone when someone dies or or they they disappear from your life. There's like this empty. There's this. There's a lyric. I forget which tune it is, but there's just this empty space where they used to be, kind of thing. But there's no closure and there's no. Yeah, I I I don't yeah. know if I have a specific one like that, but I I one of my brothers, um, as far as I know, is still alive, but. Uh, has mental health issues and we were super close growing up like we, he always had time for me the little sister right and mm -hmm. um but he's probably he's, if he's alive he's somewhere in Quebec in, in the Montreal area he was hard to be around because he was so obsessed with this story of this company he, he was on to and these people he was meeting like just this whole like beautiful mind thing and so it was hard to spend time with him yeah, because he just talked incessantly about his fantasy world. And how do you relate to that without just kind of going along with it? And being yeah, like, going along, and then you, and he also he would talk for like two hours, and you're like, okay, um, and and yeah, I never asked how you were or anything like that, and you couldn't. And I loved Pierre, uh, you know. I mean, I guess I still love him really, but he's he's not the Pierre that I grew up with. And right. uh, but I I think one of the things no one talked about him. Like once there was a point at which. He suddenly he disappeared the place where he'd been living my mom went to see him and they said oh we kicked him out like you know five months ago or whatever and uh she said oh i sent him a christmas pack and she said yeah it's here you can have it back and it was just like he disappeared and but he had overstayed his welcome at this place and wasn't paying rent and whatever and so was kicked and we had no idea where he was and I missed him so much at Christmas and because we used to go, you know, go to Montreal and I'd always have a day with Pierre and we'd go play pinball and eat steamer hot dogs and just hang out, <laughs> you know, and hang out and listen to music and whatever. Yeah. And he's a really good guitar player. And um, and I no, I would go cry in the bathroom or something because nobody talked about him. Yeah. Too painful and too unknown. It was this empty space. And so I I guess. I, I I wished and I, you know, that I had said, look, I'm missing Pierre and I know we don't know where he is or what can we do to help him? Like whether it's yeah. give him some money or buy him some clothes or, you know, could we, but it was just not talked about because it was too painful and weird, maybe. Yeah. Like you, I kind of wondered would that have helped at least put a winter coat on his back and help pay some rent or give him some Tim's cards or something, something. Yeah. About five, six years ago, the RCMP came knocking at my sister Nicole's house um, because Pierre had had a heart attack and ended up at Emerge. And we didn't know because we had no idea where he was. And so there became this gathering, at least after that. He knew where he was. Yeah. And we knew that he had kind of that he was surviving in his own way. After that, I started bringing him up and just saying, you know, what's up with Pierre? Yeah, what's up with Pierre? I just, I miss him. I wish she was more well. And it's really hard for my mom, of course. Like, of course. Pierre, right? yeah. And so, um, yeah, so I regretted not doing that earlier because I felt like maybe we could have helped him. But you know what, Christina? I think Pierre was headed down a road in his mind that it, maybe not. Maybe. You yeah, like, I don't like think it. it necessarily would have. A question I wish I had had when my brother was alive that I didn't have in my arsenal was, how can I support you? Mm -hmm. um, and just that would have been a great question too. And and hey, and leaving it at that. And I yeah. want you to think and and bringing it up again. Like I just yeah. love you, care about you, no judgment. And why I'm reminding you to let me know because I don't know how. Yeah. How can I? How can I support you as yeah. your sister, as your friend? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you want me to stop asking you that, and then, then there has to be on, on our side, the ability to like, listen, believe it, and then commit to it in some, or to set boundaries and say, well, I can do this part of what you've yeah. asked. Um, but here are the reasons why I can't do, you know, so it then becomes this sort of, we're learning how, what our boundaries are and how to still letting someone know, like, I do care about you just because I'm not doing this one thing or these two things that are harmful to my own health, maybe yeah. um, doesn't mean I don't care if you do in fact care, you know, like yeah. you can. 
Oh. You just mean, yeah. I, at one point in my life, Pierre wanted to move in with me and stay with me. And I just could, I couldn't. He came to Halifax and uh, I knew it would not be good for me. Of course. Yeah. But it was the, it was horrible so to put him on a bus and send him back because he, yeah. And I didn't hear from him for years after that. Or, yeah, that's woo! tough. That's, that's a whole other. That's tough though. Um, oh, I blame tough. myself. I carried this big rock of a blame and guilt for a very long, long, long time until we saw him again and I got to talk to him, you know, to, I'm very grateful for that. But yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Fluster is really fun. <laughs> it, it, it can be. It's okay. healing. That yes, even you're right. It, the thing about healing isn't that it's always fun and a laugh, although there's room for that. Obviously, we just laughed. Yeah. Clearly. No, you but, have um, to clean the wound, you know, and you have to, and that's uncomfortable. And yeah. <laughs> Like say I'm cooking and I, I have like garlic and a bit of shallots and some butter. And then I add wine. That smell, I totally, I remember being with my dad when we, my parents are still together. It was just me and him for some reason with one of those electric fry pans, you know, those with the mm -hmm. legs. And he was making a kind of some sort of garlic, obviously buttery wine sauce to go with fish or something. And he was showing me how to do it. And that's that smell when you put the wine in. Every time I'm like, oh, it's a nice memory of my dad. This is good. How long did it take you to realize that it's okay to have good memories and, and oh. bad memories for people in our lives? Yeah. And oh, oh my God, a long time. Probably if I smelled that smell before, a long time ago, it would make me cry or something or, make, you know, or confuse me and I wouldn't understand why. That and he taught me how to lick an ice cream cone without it melting. It's very important nice. when you're that's five. A, yeah, that's a great skill. Um, I, I've had the experience. I've had the experience of feeling bad about feeling good about the good memories, and coming yes. around to like, no, it's fine to just talk about my dad and the good things, and to also say like, you know, it was really complicated. Like, yeah. my dad was my abuser, mm. and. You know, but that doesn't mean I didn't still look up to him and yeah, and um, and get and also gain things from him. And that we didn't, yeah, and that we didn't have moments of absolute bondness, and that we didn't, yeah. but then fall apart. And you know, that's healthy. I think that because that's human beings, right? Like I behave shittily sometimes. Like for, I still do sometimes. Like I'm not. No one's perfect. I mean, some people are less perfect. <laughs> yes. Really, yes. not perfect. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's, this is true. This is true. Um, one of the other, I think, contributors growing up for, for me was, you know, hearing about my brother, Stefan, but his birth mother was, was brutally murdered by her husband and mm. just the heaviness of the tragedy and the trauma, the unhealthy dynamics mm. and it just kind of made me grow up, unfortunately, with this. There's always that air of like fucked upness, mm. you know, and you kind of go, "Oh, I don't know if I want to do this marriage thing." Like it could be re not that it could be, be really my bad, murder, but like it was really bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, How old was yeah. Stefan when that happened, or Stefan? Stefan would have been uh, 13 years old. Wow. I know that your sister was murdered, and mm -hmm. I made me wonder how that affected you and your life. Cause it's very, I mean, it's very traumatic like to hear. Yeah. And tell, tell us uh, about your sister and, and your sister's story. And sure. Uh, Michelle, Michelle was Hi, her Michelle. name. Hi Michelle. Hi Michelle. Yeah. She was beautiful. Blue eyed, black hair. Killer. Yeah. Killer. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah beautiful woman. Um, very smart. Very big sister though. Super bossy. Oh my God. She oh, was a yeah? bit scary. Yeah. Yeah. And when she, when I was little, I remember if she was really mad, she would come downstairs and play Beethoven really loud on the piano. She was a really good piano. And I would run. Really? <laughs> it was like formidably scary. Yeah. Wow. She had a temper. And um, you think she was your father's favorite? Oh, she favorite? was totally my father's favorite. Yeah. Totally my father's favorite. Uh, and in fact, they, she, uh, she ended up moving to Shediac, where she, where she died and they, they had a real connection. He was a great dad up and there's something that happened, I guess, at one point, there's like a switch that flipped 
it's like he had a midnight midlife crisis or something. So I think she got the best of him because she was older and she was very smart and very quick and very, you know, French. She was a translator. And uh, so, so they just, they had a good relationship. Anyway, we were close. Mm. I, I, as close as you can be when you have a big age, age gap. I used to spend a couple of weeks, most summers uh, living with her and her husband to take care of her then daughter, who is now a, a man, Ly- now called Linus, was then called Lynn. Mm-hmm. Linus, we're super close. We're eight hey, years Linus. apart. Hey, Linus. Hey. Linus is awesome. He's cool. my hero. And um, I would go spend two weeks in Linus and I would like, and I used to call Lynn Linus. So it's cool that Linus chose, became that name because he always was actually. And we would, whatever. I, so I'd hang out and, <clears throat> you know, we would visit and I would take care of Linus during the day or whatever. We'd go swimming and stuff. And anyway, so I hadn't seen her in a really long time. And she had had another, she'd had a little girl, um, Isabel, when she was living in Ottawa. Um, she moved to Chediac. She left Montreal. She was living in Montreal too for a while, uh, with a man, G- Gerald. I don't even know his last name. Um, I probably didn't know it. And th- he was a translator as well and, um, bought a little house in Chediac. It was like her dream to move back to Maritime, like a lot of displaced Maritimers. Yeah. And on the eve of my 30th birthday, she was murdered. She had she was murdered by her then ex. They had split up. She had, he, I get, we later sort of found out he'd been kind of doing weird shit, like turning on the water when she was in the shower and scalding her. And, you know, they, pro- they I think, uh, I think he was a very intelligent man. They probably, there was headstrongness with both of them, I imagine. Um, he had two kids from another marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and, she had realized that things were just getting weird, I guess. And then um, I kicked him out, I guess, kicked him out. Yeah. And she had little Isabel, who was about eight years old. Then, and uh, she was home and out at a friend's place overnight. And he came back. It's the classic, like it's the most vulnerable time. Oh. Um, and he, trigger warning here. He, um, he beat her to death with a hammer, Christina. Like he lost his shit and, uh, and Isabella was there. She was eight years old. So yeah, there, and he turned himself in, um, which was good. And he, I think he brought Isabel to a neighbor. Thank God. He didn't Um, hurt. I mean, he didn't hurt Isabel physically. No, he never touched her. And I don't think Michelle ever expected I don't think he ever hit her or they never were, you know, it was just, he was doing weirder and weirder things. And she realized this is fucked up. And, you know, I don't, I have her diary. There's not a lot in there, but you yeah. know, clearly she knew and uh, that there was something, yeah, it was time to go, but she was really sad too. Cause it was like, God, one of the things she said is maybe I'm too hard to love in Aww. her diary. Yeah. And uh, so the RCMP contacted my father. My father was a well-known doctor in a small place and um they thankfully kept super quiet about it because you know and uh she was murdered at home obviously and he couldn't go identify her Mm -hmm. jocelyn went you know kudos to her and uh he was never the same after that of course and i remember getting i'd been out that night i was living in toronto and uh, i was girlfriends and uh Oh, I've been to an Al-Anon meeting. Yeah. And, really? uh, you know, Adult yeah. Children of Alcoholics yeah, yeah. Uh, meeting. And it was probably when my last was like, okay, I'm good. I don't need to keep going. But it was good. It was just good. I was working a lot of stuff. Yeah. And uh, my sister, my other sister, Nicole, left me frantic messages and then called me, called me, called me. So I called her. And I remember when she said, Michelle est morte. And I was like, <sighs> what? Like, it didn't even, I assumed, you assume a car accident. I assumed yeah. it was a car accident. Or maybe suicide, like, but I, I didn't, you'd you never, never expect. expect. Like a brutal murder. A brutal murder. Yeah. And so I remember too, like, so I, she said, are you alone? I said, no, my roommate Julia's here. And 
And so I'm not alone. And I said, okay, well, I, I guess I'm coming to Montreal and we'll, we'll go, like, we'll just go to Shady. I'm like, I, we didn't know what the hell to do, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, and Linus, I think, was still in Ottawa then. And so it was just trying to figure out what to do. And so we, I remember we hung up and I went to wake up. I was, I don't think I was crying. I didn't cry. It was so shocking. Like, I don't even know what state I was in, but I woke her up. And I just like the shock. Yeah. yeah. And told her what had happened. And she was like, Jesus, fuck, you know, and I think we had a bottle of Bailey's. And so we had, we had some Bailey's just to try. And I said, well, I'm going to go phone my dad. I'm going to phone my dad you know and she she went downstairs so i phoned my dad and we were on the phone for a while and oh my god christine was terrified that we were all coming Fuck. like uh. he's like no i'll send her body to montreal i'm like no no no, we're coming like isabel like we have to deal like we're all dad yeah. i said dad sorry man but we're all cut we're coming yeah, and he was gotta... like okay Gosh, and i was on the phone with him for quite a long time and then i, I went downstairs and all my closest friends we're in the kitchen. Oh my gosh. Julia had called everybody. My, these are our university friends. We'd been friends, you know, in formative years. And uh, I'm emotional thinking about, I'm emotional yeah, about the whole thing. Me too. Thing, but Hearing I know. It. it was just like them. I'm like, what the hell are you guys all doing here? And they're like, we have to come. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, said, you need us? You, you need, yeah. You're, you're like, you? this horrible thing happened. And yeah, it yeah. was, it was amazing. It's it was amazing. A, it's a good memory in a very tragic yeah in a very time. in a very shocking tragic time and it was and i remember too to, like to, to fellow see at a time it was a short-lived relationship but you know he was there at this weird very intense time and he said you know i've got like presents in the car and like some wine i'm like fuck bring it in because no one's sleeping yeah. tonight and we just we ate cake and like i don't know it yeah. was really and then yeah. but i remember laying in bed that night wide awake and and my and my boyfriend Dave there was at the time and he was asleep but he had his arm around me and I remember laying there and thinking like how come I like what the hell happens to a person yeah to go from this laying beside someone with your arm around them to killing them and that was my second thought you know Christina quite honestly after when Nicole told me and I understood what had happened and it sank in one first it was holy fuck and then it was what happened to him to make him get to there because i'm sure he loved her at one point like yes. and thought she was amazing and then and i remember just that was like fuck the world is so sad like sometimes and so anyway yeah so it was hugely shocking my mother and father in the same room at the funeral uh and she went up to him and they hadn't seen each other in a long long time and she said hi Ben and he looked at her like do I know you like it had been that long they both aged that much and she said we don't even know each other anymore so it's Corinne wow oh and they hugged and I was like oh, moment I've never seen my parents hug this is Whoa. kind of amazing yeah but it was oh, it was off it was awful Linus yeah. was a mess obviously and um and Isabel it scared my friends, my girlfriends too, like that this could be, this could happen. Yeah. And it was not like, it's, it was not as well known or, or, or cases you heard about were p people who were already had a lot of challenges, struggles, drug addicts, you know, or, or, or prostitutes like, and, and who should have had more attention paid to them, missing and murdered indigenous women, for example. Yeah. But it was like, societally you know my you know a white collared person who's should be able to tell when something's gone wrong that you know yeah. and so th there was no um it, it was i was the only person that i knew <laughs> who that had happened to a family member it took a long time to just grieve because i hadn't seen her for a long time so it's not like a daily like when I lost my brother, Paul, we had a lot more closeness and, you know, that he, he died of a stroke and that's different. Like you, oh, it's so, it's, ah, it's right there, but there's this mm -hmm. like distance. And I remember there was a trial, you know, he was convicted of second yeah. degree murder. My sister, Nicole, and her husband adopted Isabel. Yeah. There was so, so much. There was a lot, a lot of a long time, a long time. A long time. It made my mortality really real at the age of 30, which is not usually how soon you feel that, I think. Mm -hmm. And it also 
left me with um, anything can happen at any time. And so I think there was a definite, I was already hypervigilant because of my upbringing. And then I was hypervigilant because I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. I would go through an intersection and expect a car to be coming. Like I, I still have that sometimes. And it brought us very close in a lot of ways, my family, like obviously we hung, we hung on to each other. Um, it just, it's still, it's so sad. It's just so sad. It took me a while to get angry. Same interesting it takes me a while to get angry again sometimes i get angry fast but i guess it was it had been a year and he was in jail uh, but she was he, still dead is he still in jail no he served his time and he's out so th that's the thing about that kind of death is that the reverberations are generational mm -hmm. and they the ripples go on for a long time doesn't mean I don't have a lot of joy in my life, but man, won't knock the snot out of me and yeah. my whole family. And, you know, now, of course, when they talk about domestic abuse and domestic assault, that that is the that is when most women are killed is when they leave or, you know, or they kick the guy out is because then it, the man or the person has the abuser has lost control. Yeah. And they go back and take ultimate control. And so that is. And that's what happened. And I'm sure Michelle never expected, never would have put Isabel in that situation. My brother had spent, uh, come and visited us here in this house that we live in now. Oh. Um, the, the summer before he died. And this was a big for him to leave the city of Toronto. Um, it was a, a big sign that he was, you know, on, you know, his healing process and doing really well. He, and he came and he, um, uh, the room that I'm in right now, uh, recording this from, this was his bedroom for the mm -hmm. two weeks. And, uh, I remember he, he blacked it out. Like he, uh, and he brought a computer to, you know, do his thing, like play games. And, right. Um, but it was very dark, dark in the room and, and, but he would come out, um, and we would <laughs> cook. We made him big turkey Aww. dinner, I remember. And, and sometimes he would cook. And then he would go and sleep and then we would go for bike rides or he would go. Okay. Uh, one time we went out for a bike ride and he fell asleep under a bridge. And But just like, you know, like having that freedom to go and do whatever and get, you know, in, be in contact with nature and come home. And and also, you know, we just had good laughs. And, yeah. and he really loved uh, my partner, Dale. And and. I was really looking forward to that happening more and him being able to come every year or whenever he wanted yeah. to. Um, I remember he painted this room uh, and uh. the other guest room and he loved, he just wanted to be helpful. He helped us pile wood and mm. um, just healthy. Like, oh, I'm sure it was so good for things. him. Yeah. I know, and, but that's so grounding, right? It's absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah. And, and, um, and that's, I think those, those are things he, he would have, you know, wanted more yeah. of in his life. So you're always thinking, Have I have those memories too sometimes. Of yeah. Like, ah, oh, damn it. Like it would have been so I great know. to have Stefan here and like um, just cackle about, you know. Yeah, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. I think to round this this chat with Heart Up, we should, we should chat a bit about, you do have joy in your life, but yeah. experiencing joy and then not having an immediate panic that something bad's going to happen. <laughs> I still struggle with that. Like if something good happens, I, I actually, it triggers this sort of uh, well, fight or flight, a feeling of like m almost manic or I don't even, it's like I can't handle good news and I'm almost better at handling um, bad news mm -hmm. and what to do and problem solving. So on the one hand, that's quite handy for somebody to figure out yes. how to do this and that and whatever, but like, and really being able to sit with all the, the joyful things mm. like- uh, and appreciate it and not freak out <laughs> or assume it's all going to be taken away. That's right. I, I've started to, to even just short, with short meditations every day, um, usually guided. I think we talked about Tara Brock and, you know, yeah. um, that helps because there's a pause. If you, if I can remember to pause and I pursue quiet moments of joy I, when I'm with people and we are connecting, I, it's easy to be in the moment and feel the joy. Like I am with you Yeah. and life is very full. 
And I remember there's a therapist in a long line of therapists I've had in my life who said, you know, it doesn't have to be a crisis for you to get what you want. Yeah, good one. What's their number? <laughs> She's not taking anybody right now. I know. Isn't that great? It doesn't have to be a crisis for you to ask for what you want either. And so in other words, it's not like it doesn't have to be an emergency. Mm-hmm. Like I like I suffer, I suffer from chronic depression. I have taken breaks from work because I've had episodes because of things things happening uh, mm-hmm. in my life. And so, you know, that advice was, it doesn't have to be that bad before you say, you know what, I need to pull back. Right. So th- this was, and that's, a, that's a, that's much healthier. And leaving space, like that's been the other thing, mm. is leaving space, um, which allows for joy, actually, like leaving space for things to come. Like I'm a bit lost right now. I'll be honest with you, Christina. I'm, I, I'm doing some French voice work. I'm doing some work at CBC. I'm, 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 you know, um, you know, which is great. Um, I'm working on an interesting project that may involve the Nova Scotia Youth Orchestra and Halifax Circus. Yep. Stay tuned. You're in that. That. But I'm in that in like, incubation. I don't know, and I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. And I'm just trying to be okay with that. You gotta have faith because you are working on these things, and I can relate to that too. Being in that in- incubation phase where it's like, I gotta, I have to be here to get to the next phase. Yeah. It's just extremely uncomfortable. Oh. And but having that uh, awareness of okay, I realize I'm uncomfortable, but this mm-hmm. is how it has to be, and having these conversations about it when you're feeling lonely and yeah. and confused, or like I'm not doing enough, or yeah, 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 I'm not like, achieving, and yeah, you know, I mean, to be on tour, you have to spend a lot of time booking the tour and doing yeah. all these other things, and um, producing a show is like, what about the pre-pro period and the even time before that? That yeah, so yeah. But it's uncomfortable. Um, oh, it is because you're a bit lost, you know. And I knew when I left, I would I, that I was definitely going to feel a bit lost for a while because I, every day had purpose. Getting up, going, being on top of the news, especially yeah. during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Especially during the pandemic, I need to allow space. This is what allowed me to call you the you know the your hotline, heartbeat hotline. The heartbeat hotline is that I went, hey, I'd like to talk to Christina. Thank you. Thank you for doing this podcast. This is so amazing. Welcome to the Heartbeat Hotline, 1-902-669-4769. I'm the host of a Chat with Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, a suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. Have a great fucking day. A Chat with Heart. Produced and written by me, Christina Martin. Co-produced and engineered by Dale Murray. Check out Dale's website, dalemurray.ca. The podcast theme song, Talk About It, was written by me and recorded by Dale Murray. You can find it on all the places you stream music. Production plans for this podcast and season one are supported by the province of Nova Scotia's Women in Business Implementation Fund and the Creative Industries Fund. Special thanks to Terrence Taylor for mentoring me on hosting this podcast and really digging deep with me on my production plans for season one, which, let's be honest, Terrence, ended up being more like well-needed psychotherapy for me. To Crystal Seeberger at Sensory Friendly Solutions, Thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me learn how to be a more inclusive, accessible, and sensory-friendly human. Visit my Patreon page to become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. Sign up at patreon.com forward slash Christina Martin. For this to be a massive success and reach 7 billion people, I need you to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeats, a great day.